All right. That was a hearty, a hearty welcome. <clears throat> well, um, most of you probably know Chris DeBlay. Uh, he's really uh, an amazing person, amazing pastor, pastor at our sister church, The Branch, uh, over in Alger Heights. And so uh, he is going to be with us this morning, and uh, PC is uh, over at the branch. We have I hope so. Yeah. yeah. I hope he's over there. Hopefully, Someone yeah. should be. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, it'd be bad news. <laughs> so welcome. Good to be here. Um, and gosh, uh, the greeting was robust. And, and look at all of you here today. I'm, I'm guessing it has something to do with the weather. Would you not agree? Did you walk out this morning with your winter coat on by habit and go, I don't need this? and like throw it, you know, I, I hung on to mine, but maybe you threw yours, enjoy. I, uh, it's good to, as we were praying before worship, Ben just was praying and said, God, thank you that spring does come, you know, that, that it actually does happen, and that, that life comes out of death, and we're, we're so grateful for that. Uh, so you get me again today, uh, I'm sorry, your loss, uh, we're working through this series in, uh, through some parables in the Gospel of Luke. And the two parables today, uh, the one that we're talking about here and the one that PC is doing at the branch are, I would say, the, the hardest of the bunch uh, that we're covering today. Uh, last week, or sorry, the last time I was here, so two weeks ago, we talked about the Good Samaritan story. That's a good, that's a feel-good parable. You know what I mean? Like at the end, it works out well and, and someone is restored and and. We find out what it means to be neighbor. Uh, this one has good news as well, but it might not feel like it at first. And so, yeah, yeah, yay, you know, there's my introduction. <laughs> uh, as the scripture, though, you know, so well alluded, we're, we're going to talk about a tree today. That's what the parable is about. It's about a tree. And uh, if you, you didn't sense it, the Bible is loaded with images of trees. In fact, what happens in the very beginning? There's a garden, right? And some trees that, that Adam and Eve can eat of any, and they give life, except there's that, that one, that one tree dug on it, right? How does the Bible end? Do you remember how the Bible ends? Uh, a new city is coming down from heaven, but there are trees in a new garden again. And the trees, the leaves and the fruit of the trees bring healing to the nations, it says in Revelation. So the Bible is bookended by trees, and then throughout it, uh, this image is carried forth. Right? From the stump of Jesse will come a new, a new branch. This is speaking of Jesus in the Old Testament. I mean, it's just everywhere. Trees are everywhere. Today, here it is again. Let me read the parable for you, including some verses that come before the parable. This is in Luke 13. And I would invite you to just listen this first go around, and then when we go back through it again, if you're a person who likes to pull out a Bible, you can do it. But um, the parable itself is just four verses, super short. So the five verses that preceded are really important. They're closely connected to the parable that Jesus tells. And here it is in, in Luke 13. Now there were some present with Jesus at that time, he came to him and told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too all will perish. Or those 18 who died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, for three years now, I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year. And I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. And there's the end of our merry parable. 
<laughs> so what do we make of this? What do we make of these, these verses? This passage begins with two tragedies. Did you hear them? Uh, the first is at the hands of a brutal ruler by the name of Pilate. You know Pilate, right? Jesus goes before Pilate uh, right prior to his crucifixion. This is the governor of the area, the Roman governor. And Pilate is, is brutal. There are other historical accounts of actions he took, and Pilate is brutal. And here, there's news of Pilate killing a bunch of Jewish Galileans while they're in the temple worshiping. And their blood mixes with the blood of the sacrifices. It's incredibly sacrilegious. It's incredibly um, uh, unacceptable to Jewish people for Roman soldiers to enter. I mean, it's just, it's a mess. It's a mess, and it's, it's terrible. The other tragedy is uh, part of a wall, the wall in Jerusalem, falling on people who just happen to be walking by. So there's one at the hands of a brutal ruler. There's another tragedy that seems very random. Both are terrible. Both are tragic. And both are raising a lot of questions with the people who are there with Jesus. In verse 1 it says, Now there were some present at that time who told Jesus about this thing that happened in the temple. This, by the way, is the biblical equivalent of CNN. This is breaking news coming to Jesus from people, not from Twitter, right? But from people coming and saying, hey, did you hear about what happened in the temple? And they're coming, I, it's quite clear, not just to inform Jesus of this event. They're coming because they have questions. Specifically, they want to know why. Why did this happen? Which, of course, is the question that we ask today, isn't it, when tragedies strike? We want to know why, God. Now, I don't think that Jesus has any trouble with this question. It doesn't seem in the text that he's bothered that people are, are trying to figure this out, that they're curious, that they're, they're asking why. God can handle our questions and our emotions in the midst of tragedy. In fact, I think the Scriptures are pretty clear from the Psalms and from Job that when you and I find ourselves in the midst of a, a terrible event, a loss, a tragedy, the Bible's pretty clear that, that God expects us, wants us to be honest about our emotion. So that isn't the problem here, I don't think. What Jesus does, though, speak against is the way that it would appear many of the people who were bringing this CNN breaking news alert were blaming the tragedy on the sins of the victims. Did you catch that? You've got to read between the lines a little bit here. But when they come with the news that this tragedy has happened and that these people have been murdered in the temple by Pilate's soldiers, Jesus responds by saying what? Do you think they were worse sinners than any of the other people? who were there that day? In other words, the people were saying, hey, did these people die because they were worse sinners than everybody else? Did they get what they deserved? Was this divine retribution, just punishment? Were they really, really bad people and they just got what was coming to them, right? That's kind of the question that's being asked by these people who are bringing the news. This still happens today. Recently, when there was a mass shooting, and it's hard to keep track of them now, but one of the recent ones, I heard a, a, a Christian televangelist preacher blame the people who were killed for that, for that tragedy. They must have been wicked in some way. Their sin. Or, do you remember during Katrina? Do you remember this? This is a while ago now. But I actually sat in a group of pastors shortly after Katrina, and one of them stood up and said that this was happening because the people of New Orleans were, were sinful. It was a sinful city. You know, Mardi Gras and all that bead stuff, right? And they deserved it. They deserved what they got. Do you remember what I think Jerry Falwell said after Katrina? This was God's punishment for uh, the homosexual movement, the LGBT movement in America. This was God's punishment, Hurricane Katrina. We do this today. And part of it is because we, we want to try and make 
rhyme or reason out of tragedies that seem completely unexplainable. We want to make sense of it somehow, and so sometimes we end up blaming the victims, and we pin it on their sin, and we say they deserved it. Jesus is emphatic. He says, if you think that their sin was somehow the cause of this, you are wrong. In verse 3 he says, I tell you, no. Were they worse sinners than everybody else, and so they got what they did? No. And then to drive the point home, he adds another piece of current event news in verse 4. He says, what about those 18 who died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them? Do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? And again, he says these very words, I tell you, no. We must resist the temptation to assign blame to people's sin when tragedy strikes. Jesus doesn't do this, nor should we. So these people come with these questions. He says, no, their sin's not to blame. And then Jesus shifts the focus. People are shining the spotlight. We have some here today. They're shining the spotlight on these tragic events and on the people in them. Jesus takes the spotlight and, and turns it and shines it on the people who are there with him. Because this is what happens next. I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. The people are talking about these tragedies over here and Jesus takes the spotlight and says, but what about you? We'll come back to that in a moment. Because right after this, Jesus then tells the parable. I'll read it again. A man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard. He went to look for fruit on it, but he did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, For three years now I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year. I'll dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. I want to share three thoughts from this parable and the verses that surround it. They all have to do with this line here that Jesus says twice in verses 3 and 5 around repentance. Here are the three things I want to talk about this morning. Number one, that repentance is needed by all. Number two, repentance is urgent. And number three, repentance is met with grace. So repentance first is needed by all. Jesus says, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. Ben earlier said, y'all. Remember that? Remember that part? This is, that, that's what this means, y'all. This is the southern version of, of the New Testament, right? Uh, that's the translation. But unless y'all repent, y'all too will all perish, right? This is the plural you. In other words, there's no escaping it. it it's for you and for me. Now, we're quite good, I think. At least I am. You can decide for yourself if you're good at this too. I'm pretty good at noticing, identifying, and, uh, and determining what should happen with other people's sins. I notice that pretty well. And I think to myself, can you not see that part of yourself? You really should do something about that, you know? Right? And the people that are coming to Jesus with these news flashes, they're saying something similar. Did, did you see the Galileans who got killed? If only they had, and they should have really repented, you know. Those 18 who were crushed by the wall, man, they, they really, they blew it. You know, they should have kind of turned their lives around and that never would have happened. If only my mother-in-law would start doing this or stop doing, right? I mean, we say, we say this all the time. We're pretty good at paying attention to the sin of other people. Jesus, again, though, takes the spotlight and shines it on, on you and on me. And he says, we must all repent. Now, this word repent has a lot of baggage with it, doesn't it? We imagine the person on the street corner holding the sign, shouting repent or burn, you know, or something like this, right? So the word repent has baggage. It doesn't have to, though, because it's a word that simply means 
to turn around. To, to start going in a new direction. Have you ever been with someone, you're driving in the car and you're going in the wrong direction with them? Have you ever had this happen? I was years ago uh, coming back from a Detroit Pistons basketball game with my three younger brothers. We went to a late Saturday night game. And I'm the kind of guy that likes to be in bed at like 10 o'clock. You know, I'm lame. All right, let's just get it out there. I'm an early to bed kind of guy. Have been since college. I used to get made fun of by my friends for it. So it's like 11.30 when we're getting out of the game and we've got to drive back. I've got to preach in the morning. And so I say to my brothers, hey, I'm just going just gonna to conk out, you know. They're like, whatever. Let, let me do whatever I want, you know. They're, they're doing their own thing. They're having a great time. We're headed north on 75 and we're going to catch 69, take it west towards Lansing. I fall asleep. I wake up, I don't know, 45 minutes, an hour later or so, and I'm groggy, it's past midnight. I, you know, I look out the window. We're on a huge bridge, and the exit says Bay City, you know. And it takes a minute for it to kind of click, but, you know, where are we? I finally shout out, and they look around, you know, finally kind of takes, takes stock of their surroundings and realize the mistake, right? We've missed the interchange by a good half an hour. And so guess what my brother does? He's driving. You know what he does? You know what he does because it's what you would do if you were going in the wrong direction. Gets off the highway and he turns around. Right? Of course. If you're going in the wrong direction in your car, of course you stop and you turn around. Of course you do. Right? This is what it means to repent. To realize you're going in the wrong direction and to stop and turn around. Jesus is clear. His, his focus isn't on the people in those tragedies. It's not to say that he doesn't care about them, but he turns the spotlight onto us. And he says, look at your own heart. Are you headed in the wrong direction in any way? Do you need to reorient your life? This morning, we have an opportunity to repent. And that actually is like the best news ever. Because if we're going in the wrong direction, we have the chance today to turn around. and Start aligning ourselves with the way of Jesus again. All of us are called, invited to repent. Repentance is for everyone, and it is quite urgent. You sense the urgency in this story, don't you? Do you I mean, I think it's part of what we feel when we read this story, and why when I got done reading it, no one laughed. It's not a funny story. Everyone was like, oh, yeah, I kind of feel that. It's a little heavy, right? Repent, all of you, or you will perish. The parable's about a tree getting chopped down. I mean, this is, this is stuff that should get our attention. It creates a sense of urgency about it, right? And I think what these two tragedies in the beginning, in verses 1 through 5, remind us of is that life is fragile. We live in a world that is not as it should be. Where people's actions, like Pilate's actions, can cause enormous harm. And where seemingly random walls fall down and, and wipe people out. This world is broken. It is fallen. And sometimes we humans get caught up in the chaos and our fragility is exposed. Life on this earth is fragile. We don't know the number of our days. Nor do we know the day when the vineyard owner will come back to see if the fig tree has produced fruit. And so Jesus is telling us in this parable, don't delay. I 
Now here in this passage, things are as serious as they can be. People are dying. They have, they have died. Like loss of life has happened. Trees are being cut down. This is high stakes. Would you agree? It's as serious as it gets. But life isn't always quite so dramatic. And yet these principles still apply. Let me give you an example. When in my marriage, I as a husband am not everything that, that God intends for me to be, which is a way of saying I'm not producing fruit, There are times when I refuse to repent. Anybody ever been there? You know there's a part of your life that's out of whack, you're headed in the wrong direction, but you're just not interested in turning around. You know? I'd like to keep down this road for at least another week. Can we just keep, well, I'll turn around later, but not now, right? Not now. And, you know, when that happens in my marriage or any relationship of significance, there's, a, there's something in me that needs to repent, a part of my life that needs to turn around. And I refuse to do it. I delay repentance. What happens is that fruit is not born. It's not produced. Right? The Bible tells us that when our lives are aligned with God, when we're led by the Spirit, Galatians 5, we produce the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, God, right? When we are not aligned with God, when we're headed in the opposite direction, the outcome is that there's no fruit. And so in my marriage, when I'm unwilling to repent, it's not like anyone's dying, thankfully, right? <laughs> um, you know, no, no walls are falling on anyone yet, right? I mean, so the stakes are not like as high as they are in this passage, but there's no fruit being born in my, in my relationship with my wife. And sure, I may live another 50 years. I suppose I could say that in 50 years I'll, I'll conquer or I'll turn that part of my life around. I'll repent of that thing. But that means 50 years without experiencing the joy of, of bearing fruit. Even if no one's life is on the line, there should be a sense of urgency among us. Because to delay repentance is to delay experiencing the fruit that God desires to produce in us. So Jesus says, don't delay. Life is too fragile. There's too much at stake. Turn around now. Because repentance is needed by all, it is urgent, and third, thirdly, it is met by grace. Hmm. No, no question. This parable is meant to wake us up. It's meant to shake us out of our kind of sleepy slumber and get our attention. The tree will be cut down if there is no fruit produced. That doesn't seem all that negotiable. That, there, is, there is a day when we will give an account, and when we refuse repentance in this life now, again, fruit is not born. So this is meant to get our attention, but as striking as this parable is in the fact that a tree is cut down, if we focus on that part of the parable, we miss the most remarkable part of this story. I think what Jesus wants us to do is not focus on what could happen, the cutting down of a tree, but on what has already happened. Listen again. Verse 8. Sir, the man replied, the gardener, leave it alone for one more year and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but in this parable, the tree has not produced any fruit. Is that, is that correct, right? For years, actually, right? It is, if you will, an unrepentant tree. If trees can be unrepentant, right? Not a single piece of fruit for years, and so the owner says, cut it down. 
It's taking up soil. Let's plant something else in its place. This is, this is what you would do if you had a garden as well. You expect when you plant a fruit tree to get fruit. And if you don't, after a while, you move on. But the gardener says, hold on. Give me some more time and I will get down in the dirt. And I will dig around the roots. And I will pour extra nutrients into the soil. And we'll see if this tree can turn around. Now notice the gardener doesn't say, hey, let's see if this tree can produce some fruit on its own. Let's kind of sit back and watch what happens. If it can prove to us that it is a fruit-bearing tree, then we'll kind of pay attention to it, right? Before a single piece of fruit has been produced, shoot, while the tree is still unrepentant, the gardener, who in this story is Jesus, I think you would have to come to conclude he does everything he can to help us become everything we can be. Repentance is met by grace. I would even argue that it precedes grace, or that it, grace precedes repentance. That before we've even fully turned around, Jesus is there with us, digging around our, in our soil, helping to cultivate growth, helping us to move in a new direction. Which means today, that if there is a part of your life that needs to turn around, if there's some, some aspect of your character that needs to be more aligned with God's heart, then this parable has some great news. Because it tells you that if you and I are willing to turn, and even before we turn, Jesus is there getting dirty, helping us to grow. He is at work in you and around you and for you. This is really important because we sometimes read parables like this and think, oh man, really blowing it. Really not hitting the mark here. All right, well, better roll up my sleeves. Better work really hard. Better try harder than I've ever tried before, you know. And certainly there is a need for us to be engaged and to be lending our strength to turning around. But what this parable reminds us of is that there's a gardener who's there doing everything he can to help us be everything that we can be. Grace meets repentance. It even precedes it. We're not on our own. God is with us, even when we're not bearing fruit, ready to help us turn around. So is there a part of you that needs to turn today? That's really, I think, one of the questions of this parable. It's for every one of us, repentance is, and it is urgent. Do not delay. Don't say next week, or when that person takes the first step, then I'll... I'll turn myself. Don't, don't delay repentance. And know that when you turn, God meets you and is there getting dirty in your life, helping you to turn around. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. God, what, what we desire is to be trees like those that we heard read about this morning. Trees that are planted along a river who bear fruit in every season. Trees whose leaves never wither. Olive trees who, are, who produce olives late into life who find shelter in you. But the reality, God, and you know this about us, is that we get off course. We miss the exit. We become stubborn and refuse to turn around. Help us this morning 
Help us by softening our hearts. Help us by showing the things that need, showing us the things that need to change. And then give us the courage to turn. Courage that comes because we know that you're there with us. You're digging around our roots. You're pouring out your mercy and your grace into the soil so that we might grow, so that we might bear fruit. Thank you for meeting us with grace. Always, always with grace. Thank you for loving us. Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen.